Stokes theorem is a very neat theorem that extends the notion of Green's theorem to a higher dimension. And so first we can think of Stokes theorem as a higher dimensional generalization of Green's theorem. And so remember, let's kind of quickly recall what Green's theorem was. We have some vector field F, and then we have some curve C, some closed simple curve C, positively oriented, that is the boundary of D. So say we have something like this here. So here's our curve C, our region D, and then we have some vector field. Maybe doing something interesting. So we have this vector field F. I'll say F is the vector field PQ. Uh, and then again, C is this boundary of D where C is parameterized by R of T for T between A and B, okay? And Green's theorem says that you can pass from the vector line integral of the boundary to the double integral of the partial derivatives of the interior. So we have a way from passing from the boundary the integral over the boundary to information about the partial derivatives on the interior. And that's exactly Green's theorem. It says uh, the vector line integral f dot dr over this boundary curve c is the same as the double integral over this region d of qx minus py da, or if you'd like the other notation here, this would be dq dx minus dp dy da, right? This is what Green's theorem says. It says um, that there's a relationship between the vector line integral of the boundary and the double integral of qx minus py on the interior. Right, and so we've learned about Green's theorem. Now Stokes theorem is, again, it's a higher dimensional generalization. And so you can see right away here, well, whatever Stokes theorem is, it's somehow going to relate the boundary of a region to the interior of the region. And that's correct. So let's state Stokes theorem. We have S, a piecewise smooth surface with simple closed boundary curve C, right, and say, you know, we can say S is parameterized by R of U V uh, with parameter domain D, right, which are possible U and V values. And then we could also say C, this simple closed boundary curve is parameterized by R of T or A between T and B, right? Let's give C a uh, positive orientation. And then we also want a vector field. So let's like let F be our vector field. <clears throat> so let's quickly take a look at what, what's going on here. We have some boundary curve C, say something like this. 
and it bounds a surface, maybe a surface, something like this, where um, you know you could even have holes in your surface like this maybe. Um, and so that's still not very good. Let me. There we go. So you can imagine this to be like a two hold donut with an opening on the side. And the opening is our boundary curve C, right? So this is our surface S and C is the boundary of our surface. And then we have some vector field F. Right? Behaving some way. So here's F. And Stokes theorem is going to relate an integral over the boundary to the integral over the surface, just as Green's theorem related an integral over the boundary to an integral over the interior, right? And so Stokes theorem says that the vector line integral of our vector field along this boundary curve C here, this is the same as the vector surface integral of the curl. So I won't go into the proof of this. The proof's a little lengthy. And we're at this stage, we're a lot more interested in the statement itself than techniques in the proof. So this here is the statement of Stokes' theorem. It's that what we have is we have a flux integral over the surface, right? That's what this integral is. This is flux of the curl vector field. So it, re it relates the flux of the curl over the surface to the work done that it takes to move a particle along this boundary. And so it relates a flux integral over the surface to a line integral over the boundary. And so we could record that. So remark, Stokes theorem relates flux integral over a surface to a vector line integral over its boundary C, right? Over, so a surface S. And that's the statement of Stokes' theorem. And you can see it's a higher dimensional analog of Green's theorem because it's relating properties of the surface to properties of its boundary, right? <clears throat> and so I'd like to do a few examples of Stokes theorem and going each way, right? One, we can use a line integral to calculate a surface integral and then vice versa. We can use a surface integral to calculate a line integral. And so let's look at the first example. Let's calculate Calculate the double integral of the curl. So the, vec the vector surface integral of the curl of F um, where S is. And so we're not even going to write down a function for this, um, for this surface. I'm just going to describe it. And the point is that it's extremely complicated, right? And so we'll have like a circle here. And then you can think about this surface as like a tube that's going to kind of wrap around in a circular motion here. And so this is like a tube you can think about this going around and maybe it wraps like all the way around back 
like a snake almost, and then like the tail of the snake is down here somewhere, so. And so this surface S could be extremely complicated. We'll say it's oriented outward. Um, so oriented outward. We're going to have a vector field F given by Z 2xy and x plus y with, and then the surface S is with boundary C. And the boundary is this curve here, this curve where we started. This is going to be C. We'll orient this positively as well. Um, and the parameterization for the boundary is negative sine t, 0, 1 minus cosine t for t between 0 and 2 pi. And we want to find this vector surface integral. But the surface is so complicated that we don't even really have um, a parameterization for it. But thanks to Stokes' theorem, it doesn't matter. This surface can be arbitrarily complicated. In fact, it can be any surface with this boundary, right? Any surface with this boundary is going to have the same uh, value, right? Because this is Stokes' theorem here. This is for all S with boundary curve C. So if you fix the curve C, then any surface you can possibly think of that has C as a boundary curve, the flux integral is going to be the same, which is really powerful to say that it doesn't even matter what surface this C is bounding, right? It doesn't matter. As long as you fix it, then the surface integral, the vector surface integral over all surfaces that have C as a boundary uh, will have the same flux integral. And so here, right, all we need to do is set up the vector line integral C of F dot dr, since by Stokes theorem, this is equal to the vector surface integral of the curl of F dot ds. All right, and so again, let's copy what we're doing. We're trying to calculate the vector surface integral of the curl of F. Well, thanks to Stokes theorem, this integral is much easier to calculate and it's F dot dr. And we know how to calculate f dot dr. This is the integral from a to b of f of r of t dot product r prime of t dt. All right. And so we need f of r of t and we need r prime of t. So f is z 2xy x plus y and r of t is negative sine t 0 1 minus cosine t. So we can use these together and learn that f of r of t is, well, we plug in z for the first component, right? And z is one minus cosine t, comma. Then we have two xy. Well, y is zero, so that's zero. And then we have x plus y. y is zero again, and x is negative sine t, so negative sine t here. And so for the first piece, we have integral. And what's A and B? Well, first, let's copy what we have. So I'm not getting ahead of myself. We have 1 minus cosine t, 0, negative sine t. And next, I need to calculate r prime of t. Right? Well, r prime of t can be deduced from r of t, right? If we take the derivatives of each component with respect to t, looks like we'll get negative cosine t, 0, and sine t. 
So this is negative cosine t, zero sine t, dt. Now, we need the bounds here, right? And the bounds a to b depends on the parameterization of c. And you can see that we parameterized c from zero to two pi, which means our bounds are from zero to two pi. And then we could simplify this integral. Integral zero to two pi, taking the dot product, well, it's gonna be one minus cosine t times um, negative cosine t, and then plus zero, and then it looks like we're gonna have minus sine squared. T dt. And so this integral becomes zero to two pi negative cosine t plus cosine squared t minus sine squared t dt. And now this is cosine squared minus sine squared, which is not one. There is a trig identity that says cosine squared minus sine squared is two cosine t. So this is minus cosine t plus two cosine t. Again, this is just a trig identity here, dt. And then I'll let you guys, or I'll let you all finish this integration here because it's very straight. Sorry, this is two cosine two t, not just t, it's two cosine. No, it's not even, it's just cosine two t. Sorry, my word. Can't remember my trig identity. So this is cosine two t. That's the correct trig identity, right? And now you can finish this integral from zero to two pi and verify that you get zero. Okay. So this was the first example of using Stokes theorem. Let's do one more, but in the other direction. Let's calculate the vector line integral where F, our vector field F is x, y, x squared plus y squared plus z squared and yz. And c is the boundary of the parallelogram with vertices 0, 0, whoops, 0, 0, 1, um, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, negative 1, and 2, 1, negative 2. So let's look at this. And why would we use Stokes theorem in this case, right? That's all, that's another, like, a valid question to ask is, well, if we know how to calculate these on their own, then why use Stokes theorem, right? Well, you can see here, if C is the boundary of a parallelogram, something like this, then you're going to, because of these sharp turns here, the four vertices, you would have to break this into C1, C2, C3, and C4. And then the vector line integral would be the vector line integral over C1 plus vector line integral over C2 plus vector line integral of C3 plus vector line integral over C4, right? And so you would have four vector line integrals to compute. And yes, you can do it, but Stokes theorem says you can do this with one vector surface integral, which makes ca computation a lot easier, right? And so the beauty of math is it's smart to take the easiest way out, right? And so <clears throat> let's plot this really quick and see what we get. We have zero, zero, one, we have zero, one, zero. So let me label this so everyone knows what I'm doing. So we have zero, zero, one, we have zero, one, zero, we have two, zero, negative one. And then we have two, one, negative two. So
this isn't the best picture, but you get the idea, right? This is our surface S, and then the boundary curve C is this piecewise smooth curve that's, that makes up all the edges of the parallelogram here. Um, for the sake of time, I'll skip all of this, but you can find, you know, using three of these points, you can find an equation for the plane that contains these points, right? Um, and so, or that contains all four of these points even. And what you'll get is that the surface S is the function Z equals one minus X minus Y subject to like X is between looks like X is between zero and two and Y is between zero and one, right? Um, so, okay. We are using Stokes theorem. So this vector line integral we would like to compute, which normally would have to be broken up into four vector line integrals. Well, using Stokes theorem, this is the vector surface integral of the curl of F dot DS. And so first, we need to kind of unpack what the vector surface integral is going to be, right? This is going to be the double integral over the parameter domain D of the curl of F of our parameterization of the surface and then dot product with TU cross TV. Uh, D U D V. Well, remember T U and T V are you have parameterization R of U V, and then T U is R sub U, and T V is R sub V. Right? These are tangent vectors, but you get the tangent vectors just by taking partial derivatives with respect to U and respect to V. And so to calculate this, well, we need the curl of F. And we need a parameterization of our surface. Well, if our surface is given by z equals 1 minus x minus y, we can introduce a pretty simple parameterization. So let's do this on following pages, and then we can come back to this page and finish our string of equalities here. So this will be to be continued. We need a parameterization. for um, S, right? And this is given by Z equals one minus X minus Y. Well, the easiest parameterization to introduce for an arbitrary function Z equals F of Y is to say R of U V is to set X equal to U and Y equal to V, right? And so R of U V is going to be U V and then Z is one minus X minus Y. So one minus U minus V here. So here's our parameterization. <clears throat> and if you'll notice again, the points we're looking at, X is U and Y is V. And so we need bounds for U and V, right? I'm trying to describe my parameter domain D here. Well, X starts at zero and ends at two. And so we can say, that u is between 0 and 2, and then v, or so here, I'll color coordinate. v is the same as y, and v starts at 0 and ends at 1. And so because of that, we have v bounds between 0 and 1. And this here, this is our parameter domain D, right? Next, what do we need? We described our parameter domain D and we have our, um, uh, parameterization, excuse me. So now we need the curl of F and T U cross T V. Well, since we have R of U right here, let's just calculate T U and T V. 
right? These are the partial derivatives with respect to u and v respectively. So t sub u is going to be one, zero, negative one, because that's the partial derivative of each component with respect to u, right? And then we have tv is going to be zero, one, negative one. That's because taking the partial derivative with respect to v of each component gives t sub v. Now we need their cross product. TU cross TV is equal to, well, we have to set up this determinant, IJK. Here. And then we have 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1. Take the cross product. Well, we're going to get, looks like 0 minus negative 1. So we're going to get I hat. And then minus for j hat, we're going to get negative 1 minus 0. So that's minus a negative 1. So that's plus j hat. And then k hat, it's going to be 1 minus 0, so plus k hat. And so tu cross tv is the vector 1, 1, 1. Cool. Now we just need to calculate the curl of f and then plug in our parameterization, right? Because we need curl of f of r uv. And so what's the curl of F? Well, let's remember what F is. F is, I'll just copy it. It was X, Y, um, let's see, where am I? X, Y, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, and then Y, Z. So the curl is, remember, the gradient cross F. And so the gradient cross F here we have i, j, k, and then we have the gradient, which is d, d, x, d, d, y, d, d, z, and then the vector field f, which is x, y, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and then y, z. So let's compute the curl here. We have the derivative of yz with respect to y, which is z, minus the derivative with respect to z of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is plus 2z. Okay. Well, but it's minus, right? And so it's minus 2z. It's minus positive 2z, which is minus 2z. For the second component, minus the derivative of yz with respect to x is 0. The derivative of xz, xy with respect to z is 0. So this is minus 0 j hat. And then plus, the last one, we have the derivative with respect to x of 2x plus 2y plus 2z. Well, that's 2x. And then minus the derivative with respect to y um, of xy, which is x k hat. And so the curl of f is the vector negative z, 0, x. Cool. But then we need the curl of f of r of u, v, right? Which is, now we plug in r of u, v, which is, remember, r of u, v was u, v, 1 minus u, minus v. So the curl of f is we plug in, for z, we plug in 1 minus u minus v. So that's going to be applying the negative is going to be u plus v minus 1, 0. And then x is just u. OK. And now, what do we need? For the integral, we needed the curl of f of r of u v first. So let's take that which is u plus v minus 1, 0 u. So we have, I'll give myself some more room here. This is the double integral over the region D. Curl of f of r of u v, we said was u plus v minus 1, 0 u, and then dot t u cross t v, which is 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, d u. D, V, okay. And we learned what our region D was, 
when we parameterized our surface, right? It's u goes from 0 to 2, v goes from 0 to 1. So we can plug this information in as well. This is u goes from 0 to 2, v goes from 0 to 1. Of Now we can take the dot product and get u plus v minus 1 plus 1 du dv, which is double integral u goes from 0 to 2, v goes from 0 to 1. Looks like we're just going to have u plus v du dv. And now here, this is something that we can finish relatively easily. So we might as well, right? This is integral v goes from 0 to 1 of 1 half u squared u plus uv from 2 to 0 dv. Well, this is going to be 2 plus 2v. So coming all the way over here, integral v equals 0 to 1. I said this would be 2 plus 2v d v, all right? Let me come back and make sure that's correct. We have one half u squared. When we plug in u equals two, that becomes four over two, which is two, and then plus two v. And then when we plug in zero, we get zero plus zero. Perfect. And so now when we integrate the last step, we have two v plus v squared from one to zero. Looks like we're going to have two plus one, which is three. Awesome. And so this was uh, a nice example of using Stokes theorem in both directions, right? One in the direction where you use a vector line integral to calculate a vector surface integral, and then one where you use a vector surface integral to calculate a vector line integral. Okay. Um, so this concludes what I wanted to discuss for uh, Stokes theorem, right? We've seen it's the statement of the theorem, and now uh, some pretty standard examples of how to use Stokes theorem. And next, for the final video of the semester, we'll do something very similar to this video, but with the divergence theorem. Okay, and so the divergence theorem is another very nice theorem that allows us to pass from the boundary of a region to the interior of a region. So we'll for the uh, last topic of the semester, we will explore the divergence theorem as well.